Uh, now, my next guest, uh, the, one of the other games uh, in this exhibition, The Hunter, uh, is also inspired by the forest, but maybe uh, in a different perspective. I have uh, Avalanche Studios Group CEO, Pim Holve. Pim! Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Martin. Uh, I think I love your game. It's gorgeous. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that the best thing uh, with working within games is that uh, no one's forcing us to do it because we're doing it because we love it. And I think that's really uh, good to keep in mind, and it's easy to forget. Uh, I'm actually not going to talk about uh, the design process or anything like that because I'm not qualified. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is, is, is uh, how we uh, work with games as a service, catering for the users. And I think that's my main driver. I love to say that I'm a game developer. Uh, I used to be. Uh, I'm not very much involved anymore. But what really triggers me is the relationship between uh, the player and the developer and how we can cater for something that the users want after release. So, but I'm going to go into the details. So uh, please uh, tell tech team to play video. Did I do anything? No. As while we uh, wait for the audio to be uh, uh, figured out, um, so you, you um, Avalon Studios Group is a group of studios, and it we heard a little bit about that. Yeah, that's part of my presentation, going oh. into the details, setting the scene and setting things like that. Setting the scene. But uh, did I break anything here? Okay. Oh, here, here we go. go. Yeah, right. I'll sit down again. Right. So, uh, yeah, uh, there we go. So, yes, we're one group, three divisions, uh, uh, but we work with two different business models. So, what you just saw is like the, 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 well, it's the showreel of Avalanche Studios Group. It's a mix uh, of, of things. There's a lot of violence in there. Uh, for many years, our uh, motto and, and our, our tagline was blowing shit up since 2003. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's still true. Uh, we're blowing shit up. Uh, but we're doing other stuff as well. Uh, but just to kind of get, get the idea, uh, uh, we, where we were found is publisher-funded fund games. And this is where we, together with the uh, publishers, uh, make games. Uh, the budget span between 50 to 100 million dollars. So it's roughly what the, the, the German fund for uh, boosting games is. Uh, that's one game for us within this division. Uh, and we, we, we've done some amazing uh, games there. We established an IP together with Square Enix called uh, Just Cause. It's a franchise. Uh, we have worked with Warner Brothers and, and uh, uh, on Mad Max. Uh, and recently we worked with uh, uh, Bethesda and Tim Willits with Rage 2. Super, super inspiring. Uh, then we have the other part of our business, which is, which is self-publishing. This is where we take the learnings, but also the earnings that we have made uh, from other games and invest them into our own uh, titles. Um, so there we have two divisions, Expansive Worlds, which I will be focusing on today, uh, and then Systemic Reaction. Systemic Reaction is pretty much a double A uh, kind of indie feel of games where we uh, reuse, recycle, and iterate on stuff that we've done in the AAA projects. Uh, 
Uh, the same thing we do in expansive worlds as well. But expansive worlds, uh, we only focus on outdoors recreational uh, uh, activities. So, uh, let's see, I am. Um, so, uh, the way it works is that we have built our own tech, Apex, the Apex engine, uh, that in the, its first iteration was just, just cause. Then we have evolved it over time. So it's not just about the tech, but it's also about the learnings, uh, also the team members, the skill sets and everything is being transferred into the next game. Uh, very scientific. So after Just Cause 1 was released, we started working on Just Cause 2 because it was, it was a hit. What we did then uh, by Fluke was branch off uh, an extremely violent uh, action game into a uh, hunting simulator for another client uh, that then, well, sadly went bankrupt and we uh, acquired IP back. And that was like the smartest thing that the founders of Avalanche have ever done. Uh, we're going get to in, get into the details on that later on. Uh, and then over, over the years, we have branched off and we have added new tech. Like the biggest, the only major or really major thing we did was to add Terrain 2.0 into Just Cause 3, uh, which is a, a fantastic volumetric terrain that, that makes it easy for cre uh, creators to actually sculpt uh, terrain and things. But I'm not going to go into that either. Uh, my focus is not the AAA games, uh, but it's the little gem that's called the Hunter Call of the Wild. So to set the scene, and yes, this is supposed to be about creativity, and this looks like a money slide, uh, and it is uh, to some extent. So, uh, just to set this in, the game was released in 2017, first on PC, and as you can see in the beginning here, uh, it was rather poor and it went worse. Uh, any big publisher would, would pull the plug there, uh, because uh, it doesn't make sense. If, does, if you don't have a business within three months, there's no real reason actually to kick the dead horse. Uh, but uh, I am stubborn and also very much in love with this IP. Uh, so I, I, uh, we, so we started digging for gold. Uh, was there, could we find any, any glimpses of gold in there? And we could. Uh, we could see uh, user reviews. And we could also see that certain players were playing a lot, uh, but they were giving us bad reviews. And then it was like, OK, we don't understand this language because it's Chinese. Uh, and uh, we started digging into that and we fixed the things. Well, one easy p thing was to, to localize it, simplify Chinese. And from there, it actually started uh, improving. They also told us exactly, like, okay, it's the, 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 the maps are too big. It takes too long, long to, to walk. So we gave them ATVs so they could drive and, and fixing things. So reacting to, to what they said. So uh, the game is a premium service, which means that you have to buy the base game, and then we have uh, uh, released well 25 DLCs uh, over uh, well, since, since 2017. Uh, we today uh, entertain 75 to 100,000 people a day and a million unique users every month on this game. Uh, who here has played the Hunter Cold Wild? Two. Okay, that's a good number, uh, but that's the, the, the usual re uh, reaction. The thing is that today we have 15 million uh, players in, in this game, and it's like no one really has heard about it within the industry unless you've been exposed to me. Um, but so, 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 and also, uh, this is the, the, the only money I think I'm going to talk about is that uh, this was an investment of 20 million Swedish kroners, and we have now, or in June this year, we had uh, over 1 billion Swedish kroners in gross revenue. That's a pretty good ROI, uh, I would say. We're still investing into the game, so it, it, it's costing us money. Uh, but I think the stubbornness in the beginning that still kind of manifests uh, us and, and the team uh, pays off. And it's not about the money. It's actually we don't have the money as a target. We have uh, increasing the user base and making sure that they enjoy it and that they stay. So. Uh, that brings me into the success factors. How have we achieved taking something niched as a hunting game and turning that into such a, a uh, super big happy surprise for so many people uh, across the globe? Uh, number one, it was based on another game, The Hunter Classic. This was the game that actually brought me into to the Avalanche Studios group uh, back in the days. This was a really weird anomaly. Uh, as I said, it was branched off from, from a super uh, like high-paced high octane uh, action game that turned into a single player uh, s hunting simulator it was uh, yeah uh, so and, and it was free to play as well it had nothing for it to actually uh, uh, 
to work, uh, to be, become a successful game in, in any way, shape or form. So when I was approached by the founders of Avalanche, it asked if I wanted to be the CEO of, of Expansive Worlds and run The Hunter. I looked at it uh, and I thought, this is ridiculous, this can never work. Uh, but then I started to look through the forums. Uh, this was released only on PC. They had a separate forum and I started to read the dialogue between the developers and uh, the community. And it was gorgeous because like the interaction was just fantastic. Uh, the community were super happy for every release, but they also gave, gave uh, direct feedback because many of them were hunters telling them to, to, to how can you make uh, how to make the, the experience more realistic and more uh, lifelike. Um, the weird thing was that no one on the team had actually ever hunted. Uh, so they were just Googling how to hunt, how animals behaved and how weapons worked. They hadn't even fired a weapon. So I took it upon myself when I started that I got my hunting license. Uh, also, I got so hooked uh, into hunting, but also into shooting. So now I'm, I'm also a shooting instructor now. Uh, also, I love the game so much, I actually got a hunter tattoo <laughs> as well. That's like, uh, do you have a Yarny on you? I know someone who does. Oh, cool. Uh, close enough. Uh, no, but, but the thing is, it, it, it was the, it, it's a world that re really sucks you in. Uh, it's not about killing the animals, and I want, want to stress that. It's actually be, be, being closer to nature and being part, part of that. And then, of course, the shooting part, because it's fun to shoot clay pigeons. Uh, but yeah, so, so we actually had a game already. We had a, 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 an audience. It was uh, super hardcore uh, simulation fans. And, and, and since I wanted to see, or uh, like, it's really, really difficult to play this game. Uh, if you're lucky, you can see or potentially hear an animal within 20, 20 minutes. Uh, that's not very motivating in a game. You have to be really dedicated to keep on playing. Uh, but so, so we had all the learnings here. We, we knew that the relationship with, with the hunting audience, the, or the real hunters, was really good. Uh, we knew that the realism was really good, but we knew it wasn't accessible for everyone. We had like 60% uh, of the players left uh, after 20 minutes. Uh, so it, and that was due to it being too difficult. But that's one of the success factors that we actually had um, uh, a, a, a user base. So, uh, as I think many people have stated before, uh, us being a small country in the Nordics, we have always known that we need to aim for a, a wider audience. We cannot make a game for, for Sweden, Scandinavia, or even Europe, because it's not going to be big enough. Uh, so we went as wide as we possibly could, and where we come from, so we went for Steam, PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. Uh, and and, and uh, that paid off. Also, localizing the game uh, from, from the very start. We, missed, we did miss uh, the, the simplified Chinese uh, language at the start, but we, we uh, mended that. We had eight languages in, in, the, in, the, in the very beginning. Uh, and the thing is that uh, it's easy to think that, okay, yeah, if you're on this, uh, you're gonna have, on these platforms, are going to be a success. Yes, if you have a good game. Uh, you will have a success. And also, if you have an engaged uh, community, if you have uh, a, a community that invests time and money into game, because that means that, that, that Steam, Xbox, and PlayStation will actually give you benefits, or they, they will give you or promote your show your game so you can get more users. Uh, and for example, I think the, the magic number on Steam is that you need to have a user score over 70, otherwise your, your, your game will hardly be seen at all unless you have a good relationship with your account manager. So happy engaged community uh, means better business, uh, and we do a lot to, to uh, have happy uh, uh, players. Uh, we have our team structure uh, where we don't just listen to the team uh, players, that we actually see them as a part of our team. So uh, if I would have gotten a cent for every time a game developer is saying that I represent the gamers because I am a gamer, or that the marketing team says that, team says that they uh, represent the customer, uh, I would be uh, pretty rich now. Uh, the thing is that the customer or the community needs to re represent themselves. And then the problem is that there will be different interpretations from these two camps on what they're saying, what they're doing. So what, this is why we have decided to appoint a rock star in the middle that we call product owner, that is actually the spokesperson for all these three. Uh, and I can go into greater detail on how this works, but it's helped us a lot. 
uh, to make sure uh, that the customer represents themselves. Uh, and this kind of, uh, but so, so, so uh, there's a lot, big buzz going on about being data driven in your development. And I think that's turned into to a shit show, at least uh, with us, uh, because the, it, the word data terrifies people. And it's not just about ones and zeros, it's actually uh, uh, what we see here in our uh, de live development process that data is information that we can take in uh, in our process. So it all starts off with listening and measuring, seeing what people are saying, how they're interacting with our games. Uh, and that can happen in social media, it can happen in our forums, it can happen in, in reviews, it can happen in, in uh, one to one interactions as well. Uh, and we, we, we see, and it might be something that's broken in the game or that can be improved. That means that since we're live service, we can take it back and we can fix it and re-release it. Not many other products can do that uh, in the real world. Uh, but it can also mean that we, they can guide us to, to build the next feature. So we design, create, uh, we get inspiration. In this case, from this game, it's actually just going out into the forest and you can get, get inspiration. Or you can go talk to real life hunters. You can talk to your community. Uh, but also you can look at the other games on, on, on systems as well. That's also for us data uh, points that can be, be part of this process. Uh, so designing, uh, creating, uh, we will focus test and we will uh, potentially do an early access of a game or something. Uh, we have a, a, a big beta, or yeah, we call them uh, the beta uh, co community. Uh, so we have a test audience that we can let play everything. We test, tweak, iterate, and then we release it uh, and then we see, did we get it right? If we didn't, we take it back to the drawing table. And that's like uh, the thing that, it, of course, you don't, wanna, you don't wanna do that, but you need also to include, and this is the good thing about the relationship with, with the community. If they see that you listen and that you react to their feedback, uh, you create a stronger bond as well. So then uh, we have, of course, uh, uh, our attention to detail. Me actually being a real hunter now, now know how boring it is to hunt. Uh, it's not uh, action packed in any way, it's a lot sitting around. So what we do is that we take uh, the important parts of the real experience and we give it a push in the fun direction. Um, so, and also making sure that, that where it matters, it has to be super, super uh, perfect. So when we started making a dog, uh, as a companion uh, for you in, in the game, rather than just letting animators animate it, uh, we uh, mo-capped a dog together with our friends at, at Goodbye Kansas, and that turned out fantastic. We had released dogs before, they have looked pretty daft uh, animation-wise, but actually getting real dog data in there. Uh, I am curious though if Martin, your AI stuff can uh, generate uh, cool dog behaviors, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so this is just an example. We did tons of this. We spend a lot of time uh, just uh, uh, recording different sounds in different kinds of forest and different ki kind of weathers and things like that. And, 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 and it's really, really the love of the nature uh, from the developers and the community that drives us. So just kind of to uh, summarize that what we know about our audience uh, is that uh, sense release, and that's including not just the, the first month that looked really, really horrible, but also the, the, the console release. Uh, we have 24% are st still playing from that year, which is amazing. 41% uh, playing for, for uh, one to two years. And uh, we have really, really long play sessions. That's also because of the design of the game demands that you play more than one hour. Uh, but we have, have many players that play, played over a thousand hours in the game, which is really fantastic. Also, uh, okay, I'm talking about money here again, sorry about that, but uh, we have a really strong attach rate that thir over 30% of the users uh, buy DLCs. And that's not about the money, uh, I'll put that in here. It's because it shows that they actually want to, they want more, 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 uh, more content, they want to engage more uh, with the game. Uh, and the weird thing is, and, and this is like every marketeers within gaming's uh, wet dream, is that you can re-engage churned users by releasing new content. And this actually works for us. Uh, we based, so we survey our, 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 uh, our, our players. They say that, okay, we want to hunt in Louisiana. Uh, and then we say that, yes, we have listened. This takes us a long time to build this. So 
uh, but we will build it if that's like on the top of, of the community's agenda. And when we release it, churn users will come back because we're delivering, because we still have the relationship uh, with them, which is fantastic. Uh, so we also know that 50% of our, our current user base hunts in real life or does some kind of hunting uh, activities, which is fantastic. So they are experts that can give us uh, expert feed feedback. But we also know that even a bigger crowd of our user base fish and do other outdoors activities so they can guide us in, in further development into to other uh, creative processes as well, which is fantastic. So yeah, so, so this is a bit of an anomaly uh, uh, of a game uh, and it's, it's, it's a really, really weird one uh, because it's, it's, a, it's a niched game that's become uh, like the comfort uh, game for many, many players. I had a, had a slide with a lot of quotes from people saying that this is uh, meditation and things like that, but I thought that was kind of cheesy and I really regret that I didn't put it in now, so I'm saying it in instead. Uh, but uh, what we are, are experiencing and, and seeing, and uh, I, oh, I said this at dinner uh, yesterday, uh, while I was working at the shooting range, uh, this was before the pandemic, like two of, of our members were sitting and talking about hunts uh, or a specific hunt. And this happens a lot at the, at the, at the shooting range or at, at my club. And I overheard the conversation. And then I realized that one guy is actually talking about describing a hunt in the hunter call of the wild, like it was a real experience. And that's super, super cool because that's really my or our, our ambition to kind of blur the lines between reality, the real hunt or the real outdoors activity and what we're, we're providing. Uh, we have gotten tons of, of emails and posts from, from, from community members uh, during, uh, well, during COVID because of lockdown, but also when they're in hospital or retired hunters uh, saying that we have actually filled the gap that they have in their lives with this game because it's so realistic. Uh, and it's providing them, them, them the sense of actually being in the forest. So with that said, I think I'm going to say, uh, Tech, can you please play next video? Thank you. Ta-da! Thanks a lot, Pim. Uh, again, I have many questions for you, but I'll save them for the panel. But just because I can't resist, really impressive with the mocap dog. Will you do a mocap moose? Uh, that's oh, I would love to. Uh, uh, the thing is, when we were going to do Africa, and Africa was really, really uh, the African reserve was a really, really hard decision because uh, we thought the expectations were going to be. Uh, big five, and that was not what the community wanted. But uh, so we didn't deliver that. But I really wanted to to to, to mow cap a lion. Oh. Uh, so, but uh, no, uh, yeah, we we can see if we can. The problem is that uh, I don't like to, to kind of have uh, the whole zoo thing is not uh, a big uh, and kept animals. I think that's going to be a tricky one because uh, I'm sure there's a Chinese mocap studio somewhere that ha has all these animals. Um, I'm sure what the, the uh, I'm worried about their well-being. I see. Yeah. Well, I would share those concerns. Cool. Maybe we should let it stay as a joke. Pim, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>